Again, I titled the sermon, True Freedom. True Freedom, a Slave to Righteousness. And we'll see what that means. To be truly free means to be a slave. Interesting. So we're going to read <clears throat> from verse, tw verse 12 up to verse 18. Verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your, pre present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been bought, brought from the dead to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then are we to sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Let's just pray and ask the Lord to bless this word. Lord, when we come this morning and we read the word of God, we, we realize that this, these words are the words that you have inspired. These words are your word for us as believers. And help us, Lord, to understand them. And help us, Lord, to get rid of the wrong thinking in our lives. And that we will commit our lives to what you want, want for us. I pray that you will bless this word for everyone that listens. That the Spirit will in, illuminate it to our hearts. And that we will understand it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, don't put that picture up before I tell you. She actually burst my bubble this morning, but anyway. <laughs> now, we're continuing with our sermon series for um, those who are visiting Cheryl's brothers here in Romans. And this is the 31st sermon in Romans. So, it's been a... Uh, a while since we started and we've come a, f a long way now our pa passage today is about what true freedom is what it means to be truly free yes we spoke about freedom in Christ it's not apart from Christ it's to be in Christ but what does it truly mean to be free and it means to be a slave of righteousness now some of you might know this uh, some of you know this some of you don't that the day before Easter, I went to buy some eggs to hatch them, built my own incubator, and uh, actually bought Easter eggs. Can you believe it? There's Easter chickens that lay different color eggs. So I got white and green, and uh, yeah, those two that I did get. So I, you can put the picture up there just to show them there's the eggs that I got. And... They hatched on the 27th of April. Who knows what the day 27th of April was? Freedom Day. So they freedom chickens. <laughs> Show them the next one. That was yesterday. They're quite becoming big now, six weeks. And uh, on Freedom Day, we celebrate... The freedoms we have in South Africa, that's what South Africans celebrate. But I think most people don't understand. They misunderstand what freedom truly is. They don't really know what it is. Now, I thought about this. If I take those chickens, now, if you look at that, they're in a coop that I made. If I just loosen them and say, you're free, run my chickens, okay? I promise you, they won't survive a day. They'll be dead by the end of the day. Because there's a lot of dogs, a lot of cats, a lot of predators, 
that would love that. Okay, my cat, she, she's half the day she's walking around the chicken coop looking at them. And my dog loves to, to scare them, you know, that kind of thing. They're not truly free. So, uh, um, can you imagine our society, what would happen if everyone was just free to do whatever they want to do? No laws, no government, no justice system, just no boundaries, just total anarchy. Uh, attempts to throw off all restraints and to reject any attempt to come under authority is a fantasy and non-existent. Now, I don't know if you know who wrote this song. Let's see who knows them, know, know, know their music. In 1979, there was a person who wrote the song, Gotta Serve Somebody. Can you hear the music? Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan wrote, not a, I don't think he's a Christian. But anyways... He, he wrote the song, God has served somebody. And I want to read to you the, the, the refrain, the chorus part of the song. He says, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Now, I don't think he wrote this for the Lord or a Christian song, but it actually reflects the truth. You will always serve somebody. So true freedom without laws and restraint is a fantasy. True freedom is to be a slave of righteousness. That's true freedom. Now, maybe, um, maybe he read Romans, I don't know. But that's what this passage is about. What is true freedom? The biblical understanding of freedom is what we read in Romans 6. Now, my first point this morning is... To be free in Christ. Verse 12 to 13. So let's look at that. Verse 12. And if you remember verse 11 said. Because we are dead to sin. And alive to God. That was last week's sermon. Dead to sin, alive to God. Because we were made dead to sin in the death of Christ. Being identified with his death and resurrection. And made alive with him. That's what baptism basically symbolizes to bury being buried with Christ to be raised with Christ to to be alive because of that let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that's what he says because you are dead to sin alive to God let not sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions Paul spells out for us what it means to be a believer. He commands them, let not sin, therefore reign. This is a call to action. Make it your practice never to let sin hold sway over you. Yes, our salvation, let me make the point clear, is secure in Christ. Amen? When you're a believer, when you are born again, you are saved, you are secured, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, you are guaranteed eternal salvation. But we still live in a sinful world. We still live in a fallen world. We still need to face the struggle of sin every day of our lives as a believer. There will always be this ongoing battle within us in this world. Now, sin, it's interesting, Paul personifies, personifies here, of what this personifies, sin in this text. He says, it's like someone who wants to reign over you. It's like someone who wants to tempt you in worldly pleasures. Someone who wants to make you obey its, play, uh, its passions. And then he says, let it not reign in your mortal body. When Paul talks about the mortal body, the Greek word is suoma, 
And it can refer to the physical body. Yes, and I do believe in this case it refers to that. But I think it's a little bit more than just the physical body of, of the man. But it also has to do with your thoughts, your minds, and your whole being as human, as a person. And how you interact with this world. How your body is susceptible to sin and temptations of this world. You see, the battle against sin is in fact a spiritual battle. It begins in the mind. And, and we've studied this years ago in James when we did the book of James. It starts with a thought. But it's a battle. It's a spiritual battle. And you win and lose in the daily decisions you make about how to use your body and the reason why Paul says mortal body is to remind us that the physical body still participates in weaknesses and in sufferings we are still part of this broken world even though you are saved even though you are in Christ even though you've been made a new creation dead to sin alive to God you still have this Body. Now, I don't know about you. When I got saved, I looked into the mirror and I still looked as ugly as I did before I got saved. I thought I was going to change into this angel. Okay, didn't happen. Although we are born again, we still live in a mortal body that can give in to sin and it's temptations. And you need to understand as a believer this. You need to realize that you're not sinless. You're not above. You can still sin. And until we are finally saved from this mortal body. We call it in theological terms glorification. And receive immortal bodies. We will be continuously subject, subject to the influences of this age. And believers should let not let these influences reign over them they should not hold sway to them but we also have the indwelling holy spirit and that's ma that makes the difference we stand in grace the bible says when we walk in the spirit we can resist sin we are not only positionally in christ free in christ but we can also experience this freedom in Christ in our daily walk, in our lives, every single day. You are, and you are called as a believer to live in this freedom. You need to intentionally and willingly choose not to let sin reign in your mortal body. Why? Because you are dead to sin, you are alive to God. That's Paul's point. It's a choice. Verse 13 says, Do not present your members to sin as instruments of right for right unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Do not present your members. Interesting, verse 11 says, Consider yourselves. Verse 12 says, your mortal body. Verse 13 says, your members. Talking about the parts of your body. Okay? That's what members refer to. It starts from general you. It moves to definite body. And it moves even further to the parts. The different parts of your body. He calls them also in this verse as in instruments. And you're not to use... Your members as instruments of unrighteousness and offer service to this tyrant, tyrant sin who is no ruler of you anymore, has no authority over you, you anymore. You have bought with the precious blood of Christ. You belong to God. He's your ruler. He's your authority. But you cannot go back to the old ma um, master and now present your members as instruments to be used for him. That's the idea. Why, why would you serve someone who is no longer ruling over you? There's no say over you. You should rather use your members to serve God. To present to him, your members to, to righteousness. 
Now, what does it mean to present your members to righteousness and to God? What does it mean? It means to surrender all. We sing that song, I surrender all. It's to surrender everything. You, your body, your members, everything to God. Every part of you, your mind, your thoughts, your actions. If you are dead to sin and life to God, that it, then it means that God is the rightful ruler of your life. You must not now give yourself in service to Him. Yes, you are free from sin, but you're a slave of God. That's true freedom. Now let me emphasize this. There is no neutral position. Hello? You've got to serve somebody. You've got to serve somebody. You're either serving sin or you're serving God. There's no neutral position. You see, if you choose not to serve God, you automatically choose not uh, to serve sin. And to present yourself to God and serve Him is only possible because you find yourself in this new position as a result of your unification with Christ in His death and resurrection. That's the only way you can be alive, to ma made alive to God, to serve Him. It is only possible because you are dead to sin, alive to God. Now being alive is obviously the state of the believer. And the believer in Christ, you are alive to God to serve Him. Now before you think it's, uh, this is not easy, this is very difficult to, 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 to not let sin reign in your life. And how do I do this? Paul reminds you in the next verse, he says, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What does it mean? And I'll, the next point I'll spend some time on what it means to be under the law and under grace. Now Paul reassures, he reassures the believer of his status and freedom in Christ. Sin has no dominion over you. So when you sin, you're doing it willingly, voluntarily, not because he's your master. Instead, um, well, Paul reassures us. In other words, the law cannot condemn us or bring the penalty of sin because it has been nullified by the cross of Calvary, with, by Jesus' death on the cross. Instead, he says we are under grace. And grace provides forgiveness. It provides redemption. But this grace, remember chapter 5 verse 1 and 2. We access through faith. And this grace that we are standing in. Remember those words in Greek where, where we are cemented into the grace of God in which we stand. And remember the Holy Spirit that was given to you empowers you to do this. So if you think it's impossible, Holy Spirit gives you the power to do it. The grace that you stand in gives you the power to do this. To be instruments of righteousness. So let me just quickly spend time on this, not too long, on what does it mean to be under the law and under grace. When Paul says we are not under the law, what does it mean? Let me start by saying what it does not mean. It does not mean since God's grace covers you, you have, don't have to worry about doing any obey, obedience, obeying God or keeping the law. That's not what it means. Paul is not promoting lawlessness. Paul is not saying to chickens, run. The world is your oyster. Is that is what it means to say? I see why I lost my mate. Just go. There's no boundaries. There's no laws. That's not what Paul is promoting. 
to do whatever you want and to ha- or however live however you want to live the view this actually contradicts everything he says about presenting your members to God as instruments of righteousness you cannot serve God and at the same time do whatever you want. And I've got a problem with people saying, oh, you can be saved, but he, Jesus is not your Lord. Does it make sense? First you need to be saved and then later on you can make Him your Lord. Really? When you get saved, you accept Him as everything He is. God, Savior, Lord. The Son of God. He's everything. You accept Him. And He's Lord of your life. When you get saved. When Paul talks about under the law and under grace, he's referring to, in the context, to the old system. The old system of the law. The old dispensation of the law. The old covenant, if you want to put that in. And the new system of grace. The new testament. The new covenant. The old system condemned. The new system saves. The the law brought knowledge of sin. Grace brings freedom from sin. That's the context. So don't use that verse. Say, oh, I'm not under the law. So I can do whatever I want. You won't survive a day. No. <laughs> if you get what I'm saying. Does it mean that we have no laws? No, we serve God. We obey God because we are alive to God. We are now, we have the ability to obey Him. When we, we, when we were not saved, everything we did was just religion. Now that we are saved, we are alive to God, we can obey and serve Him. Klinks is ons God. You see, <clears throat> we serve God, we obey Him because we are alive under the law. We could not satisfy Him. Under grace, we are free to serve Him. To be under the law in this context is to be subject to the constraining and sin strengthening regime of the old system to be under grace is to be subject to the new dispensation in which freedom from the power of sin is available so to be under the law does not mean the believer has no obligation to god's commandments in fact verse 18 says and it says that we became slaves of righteousness So the point is we can live holy lives because we are dead to sin and alive to God. We appropriate the benefits of our union with Christ. And this is what it means to be under grace. Now there's a 17th century Puritan called Jeremiah Burroughs. I don't know if I pronounce it right. Burroughs. Who said the following... From him, that is Christ, as from a fountain, sanctification flows into the souls of the saints. Their sanctification comes not so much from their struggling and endeavors and vows and resolutions. It comes, from, comes flowing to them from their union with him. Because you are alive to God, because you are in Christ, because... In Christ you are made free to serve God, to live for Him, to obey Him. This brings me to the third point, and that is, we are free to serve. Verse 15 to 8, we are free to serve. Verse 15, and obviously when Paul says you are not under the law, you are under grace, it kind of brings a lot of questions to his audience and then he answers that. He says, what then are we, uh, are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? And he answers it, by no means. So you ever thought that now you can do whatever you want? Paul says, that's not what I'm saying. By no means. Verse 15 to 18 addresses this question, how believers should live under grace and freedom from sin. 
Paul makes it clear that yes, we are free from the binding power of the law, but at the same time we are, we, we are under obligation to obey, obey our new master. He is our Lord. Many people think that you need to be under the law to restrain and overcome sin. Oh, you mustn't do that. Oh, you mustn't do that. Oh, you mustn't do that. And they think that is the way to restrain and overcome sin in their lives. They also think, many people think that grace is an excuse or a license to go and do whatever you do because God will forgive you and His grace to try, um, to try and keep the law is, uh, is just a means to righteousness and it will increase condemnation that's what the word says but it's the opposite it's you you cannot you cannot be set free from sin by trying to to obey laws you only are set free from from sin and given grace so that you overcame sin truth is grace helps us to overcome and sin in our lives and live free for God. Grace overthrows the reign of sin. And that's what we read in Titus 2 verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. What does grace do? Training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present life. So let me tell you, law will not do that. But grace will do that. And because grace is in your life, you obey God. It's just the opposite of what people sometimes think. It is by grace through faith that we saved, that we are set free from the bondage of sin, that we are free to serve God and live right before God. Under grace, there are obligations of obedience that must be taken seriously. Under grace. It is not whether you have a master, but it is who is your master. You've got to serve somebody. It's who you serve. Serving sin leads to death. Serving God leads to life. That's the point. That's what Paul is comparing the two with. Verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Either of sin leads to death or obedience leads to righteousness. Is he saying when you obey the law that you are made righteous? He's talking about sanctification. He's not talking about justification. So let me just point that out. Paul presents a contrast between being a slave to sin and a slave to righteousness. Just as a slave belongs to his master and serve him, in the same way believers belong to God and serve him. And that leads to righteous living. And this, for this reason, we are slaves to righteousness. So, now you cannot keep on sinning like you want to. Because you don't own yourself. Did you know that? When you became a child of God, you belong to him. There's a verse that says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit to whom we belong to. You're a slave of, right, of righteousness. And by obeying God and living righteously, you will experience the transforming grace, the transforming power of God's grace in your life. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart. There's the key. Because we are saved, because we are made alive, because our hearts have been changed, we've been given a new heart. From that heart, we became obedient. To the standard of teaching. What is he referring to? The gospel. That's the standard of teaching. Obedience from the heart. And Paul is grateful for this grace that changed him. When God saves us, we change from the inside out. It's never from the outside in. Okay? One day the outside will also be moy and beautiful and 
So don't worry. Did you know this? It, every one out of three people are ugly. Okay, let's do something. Turn to the person, look to the person right of you, on your right side. Look at them. Look to the person on your left side. Okay. Now, if they are both beautiful, <laughs> you get it, nay. <laughs> oh, just a joke. But we are changed on the inside, and one day we will be changed on the outside. The promise of resurrection. All the ailments, all the issues, the knig, the rug, the sickness, the pain, all of that will be gone. Praise God. We will be complete. I'm looking forward to that day. And the more you feel pain and ache and uh, struggle, may you be reminded that you are not made for this world. <clears throat> Christian freedom is not freedom to do what you want. It's freedom to obey Him freely. Willingly, joyfully, naturally obey God. Grace gives us the freedom to serve. You are free to serve. Say that. I am free to serve. I'm free to serve Him. Now I read the story and I'll close with this story about a bazaar in, and it's also about chicken, sorry. Okay, yeah. It's about a bazaar in the village of India, a farmer brought his small flock. Okay, I said quail, quails, but it's chickens. He, he brought them and he tied to each bird a string around its foot with, with the other end tied to a ring on an upright stick. Okay, obviously he didn't want his flock to run away because it's a bazaar. They're going to probably sell it there. So the chickens walked around and around and around and around the stick. Okay? You can just imagine. Okay? held captive by the string. No one wanted to buy them until some devout Hindu came along and because of his religious respect for all life and his compassion for these birds, he bought all of them. He said, let me buy all of these chickens. I'll take them. So he pays for them and then he told the merchant, now let them free. Now I know there are some of these Tree huggers wants to let all the animals let go. The merchant was surprised, but he, but he insisted, cut the strings and set them all free. So the farmer cut the strings. But the chickens kept walking around the stick. Around and around the circle. In a circle, no strings. That's where, that's where it comes from, no strings attached. Okay. Finally, he shoo them off. Say, hey, oh, come flieg. Okay? But even then, they would land a short, a short distance away and then resume marching in a circle. As they've done when they were tied to a stick. Why am I telling you the story? God didn't free you from sin so that you would keep on going in circles and continue with your sin life. He freed you from sin so that you would become a slave of obedience. So that you become a slave of righteousness. That, that your relationship will result in a righteous living for God. You've got to serve somebody. The question is not if you are serving. The question is who you are serving. Who are you serving? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you that Jesus Christ died for us, for our sins, paid the penalty for our sins on the cross, but justified us through his resurrection. 
And because of faith, we access the grace that you've given to us. And now that we are children of God, set free from sin, dead to sin, alive to God, help us, Lord, not to allow sin to rule over us. Help us, Lord, to be free in Christ and to believe and live under the grace that you have given us as, freed, um, as, as slaves of obedience to God's righteousness. Help us, Lord, to live for you. And Lord, yes, we, we give in to the temptations of this world. And yes, Lord, we sin. And I ask that you'll forgive us of our sins. We repent from them. I ask that you'll help us to live holy and sanctified lives before you. But it all begins by considering ourselves dead to sin, alive to God, and also not allowing that sin will reign over our lives, that we will present our members, that we will surrender all, our thoughts, everything, our, our, our deeds, our, our bodies, everything surrender as a living sacrifice to the God of our lives, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And I pray this morning, if there's anyone who's struggling with sin in their life, that they will understand from the scripture that God has not, made, has not kept them in the position of sin. God has removed them from that. He has set them free from that. And they are free to serve you. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, where we fall short. I pray that in the precious name of Jesus Christ, of our Lord and our Savior. Amen.